Good morning. Welcome to Clay Chat. This morning we speak to Leslie Ann on a cold morning from Joburg, and we're going to have a hot chat with her. Um, I think she's one of our warrior ceramicists in South Africa, an idol, um, and she's going to share with us her journey, um, her philosophy, and her new work. And I'm very excited to share with you. And I'm going to hand over to Leslie Ann. Thank you, Rika. <laughs> Okay, I, I, I almost half expected that picture of myself to start talking. <laughs> um, yeah, the long journey. Okay, so um, really I want to say that the very, very first time that I felt the magic, you could call it, of the clay, because that's what it's all about. I was eight years old and my mother came home with two pieces of pottery, basically a couple of slabs that had been upturned around the edges and slip trailed and glazed with a clear glaze. And I was told that she'd made them and I couldn't believe it. This was something ridiculous to me that my mother made those things that you can only kind of buy. So I think, you know, immediately something sparked there. However, we didn't really get involved too much. I went to pottery class with her once in the school holidays, much to her teacher Pam Bass's chagrin, she brought her children made a little tiny little bunny rabbit with its ears against its body and a tiny little uh, jam jar on a pedestal because our crystal glass one at home was a little round jar on a pedestal and uh, didn't do much more but every week my mother would come home with something she made and um, it was awesome it was absolutely awesome so gradually we were learning by osmosis um, and uh, every now and then getting a little bit of a slab and pressing a leaf into it and going through that thing. Um, however, um, then uh, um, gradually as I got older, my mum started um, setting up a little studio at home for my brother's friends who wanted to come and pot on a Sunday morning. And so the clay was there, the wheel was there, um, and um, we were living at the teacher's training college uh, where my father was a lecturer. Which my mum had a kiln and a wheel, um, actually, before, before we moved. Um, I'm going to just show you this little puppy dog that I made when I was about 13, I think. So it was a little Basset Hound puppy. The inspiration was right there with our Basset Hound puppies. Anyway, that's one of the earliest things I've ever made. The little puppy, it even says Cookie on the bottom, which was my name as a child. <laughs> anyway, um, needless to say, my mother went to pottery classes um, every week, and this was really inspiring. She then moved on to John Edwards and Val May, John Edwards who taught in Fairwood in Johannesburg, a wonderful man from a line of six generations of potters. And my mum would again bring something home every, every week and we would rage over it. Um, my father then died and we moved house. And actually before he died, I must just say that um, I lived in a mansion. The teacher's training college moved their residence to a beautiful mansion. So I felt like a princess living in this plush carpeted, chandeliered, wooden paneled, marble courtyard mansion um, with the uh, kiln down in the cellar in the basement. And um, so it was a bit of a balance there. Yeah, I was a princess, but my daddy was dying at the age of 12, I was. However, I did make a little pendant once. And I had my first sale when I was about 12 to one of the students who lived in the residence. Um, he bought a pendant. I think it must have been about 20 cents. And that was quite a lot of money for a little girl way back then. Anyway, we had to move house and my mother started a little studio of her own in the laundry of the house. And um, that's where I made this little puppy dog. Um, didn't think much more of it. And then um, her friends were interested in learning. And so they started in the kitchen. The kiln was out in the, in the laundry. And then she got a few more people interested and then she moved the pottery into the garage. The cars moved out, it got a little bit bigger. And 
all this time this osmosis was sort of happening. And um, then Val Edwards, John's, her, her teacher's um, wife, started teaching handwork. And this was absolutely inspiring to me. It wasn't, all the other stuff is wheel work. We were throwing a little bit on the wheel at home, learning how to make cups, learning the hard way, making all the mistakes as children actually just playing. So um, it was always kind of part of us growing up. And um, you can move on a little bit, or maybe a shot, maybe a slide, Rico. This was stuff that I made with John and at Val, Val Edwards Studio. Um, the big pot at the bottom, the small picture of a big pot at the bottom was a coil pot that I'd made. Um, and the beads were little you know, squeezy beads. I was experimenting with all sorts of plasticity of clay. Um, I was attending class with Val Edwards where my mother was also doing some handwork there. And um, she was more a slab worker with fine carvings. She didn't, she wasn't a pinch potter or a coil potter at all. And luckily for me, she saw potential somehow um, because she didn't really teach so much. She helped you with the first thing you wanted to make. The second one, you, she might help you a little bit and the rest of the time you were on your own. Um, but just by watching Valme's fingers working the rim of a pot, or feeling the weight, or just the way she, she just said, you have to love the room. And that just stays with you and becomes one of the strongest memes. You just have to love it. So these was, this is pinch pottery. I found the Paulus Berenson Finding Your Way with Clay book. And I was incredibly inspired by the little pinch pots. So these are sort of pinch pots, adding colors to the clay. Um, Finally, little, using little coils and experimenting with the plasticity of the clay and the quality of the different clays and what different things that they used to do. So um, let's have a look at the next shot and see what I can. Oh, okay, this is a lot later. <laughs> I have a not so much later. So I was with, I was, uh, okay, before I moved to the studio, this is my um, studio in Cape Town in the basement garage of a block of flats. Um, before I left Johannesburg, my brother and I were offered, uh, well, first of all, I, when I left school, I uh, went to teacher's training college because I was brought up there and I was going to be a teacher and I was a bit unconscious. I hadn't thought about anything at all. Um, so, um, um, sorry, back, where was I? Um, Oh, it's still in Johannesburg, where Val may had, uh oh, too far forward. <laughs> Back, okay, that's fine. You can leave it in Clove Street. <laughs> um, Sorry, Liz, we have a little glitch here. There we go. Okay, so um, when I was with Val May, I started pinching. I, I wanted to, to I, I wasn't a slab potter with these carvings that she made, but I was very confused about what I really wanted to do. I knew I wanted to make pots, but I didn't know who I was yet at all. And Valme said to me, pinch a pot. And I thought that's rather a scene suggestion because a pinch pot's rather like a glorified cow pat in my experience. And, um, but I was actually kind of desperate to get to the bottom. And so I took a small piece of red earthen red clay made a little ball and started pinching this pot and it hooked me it got me involved i pinched and i pinched and i pinched and it got thinner and thinner because i'd been exploring the plasticity of clay a bit and this pinching was just stretching and being beautiful and, and being really nice and i kind of fell in love with it i got the magic there as well and um, although it wasn't fired in the right way, actually, well, it was fired to high stone, so it walked a bit because I didn't know the clay had a memory at that point. And I decorated with a little diatomaceous pattern inside with some wax resist. And it was just had that kind of magic that wanted me to carry on pinching. So I pinched another little pot. Then I found my finger marks started making edges that I could work on. Then I thought, well, I'm gonna make a big one. So I tried a big one using the basic principles of throwing on the wheel, which is pinch down into the bottom, make the floor, leave some support at the bottom, pinch it up, 
press it out. So I was, um, of course, trying to run before I could walk. And I made a big pinch spot and I pinched it out most beautifully with my finger marks showing and, and I went into the studio the next day. And of course it had cracked because it was too big. <laughs> So I went back and I started smaller pinch pots and I was making little pinch pots like you see in this picture, just like that. And um, that's in my studio in, in Clue Street. So Valme saw the potential in me and she and her husband, John, were going to move on to a farm in Natal. And she offered to my brother and I the, the teaching to, to teach because they were teaching, John had about nine wheels going at a time. Val had about six people at one time and they were, they were teaching together in the most beautiful studio, an eighth of an acre, swimming pool in the garden, a double studio, double kiln garage, clay making machinery. It was, it was a master of efficiency. See that man. Um, however, I do consider myself a pinch potter and I do consider myself self-taught in that way because I did the empirical thing from tiny, tiny little bits of clay. I try and pinch a little egg that felt the same way to the, an egg that still has its yolk inside it to try and get a perfect form. So if you closed your eyes and I gave you an egg and I gave you my, my egg that I've made, I want you to be confused about which was the real one. Um, silly things like that. Mm. We've moved a bit further forward at the moment. We're still back. I was in Clue Street. I was teaching there in a basement garage and um, doing um, basically pinching a base like the, um, like the um, Pueblo style potters, um, except I don't use a little cookie underneath. And I just started coiling and gradually getting bigger and bigger and learning from teaching, as a matter of fact. These little pinch pots, they're two halves that are joined together. And then they were painted with slip and then pressed and carved through the slip. These are the first bottles that I had made, two halves joined together. These little ones were the next, they were a little bit more refined and a bit burnished. Those were painted with a red slip um, impression bisked and then um, polished with black polish to make them look kind of woody. Um, this was um, when I had started Raku, which was actually way beyond, I don't know. Uh, okay, first of all came stoneware. I was doing a lot of stoneware. Mm -hmm. um, the Raku, they kind of started overlapping. I was doing stoneware and burnished fired, uh, pit fired pottery. And then, rather, the stoneware was a little bit too high fired for handwork, I found. And oxidized stoneware for me was dead. I had to try and enliven it to try and make it look almost reduced. Um, it was like in the early days we did earthenware, only. And every time you overfired a kiln, you got some interesting results. So the temptation to go higher to, to get a the stoneware look was there. And then once you were doing stoneware, you wanted to do everything to try and get a reduced fired look to create and to achieve the, the fire magic. Magic is the unexpected treasure that you get that you can't plan. And you, you, we do it for that. If you plan it, it comes out exactly as you want it. We might as well not have done it actually. I find planning it is too cerebral and it's not part of the real inspiration. Um, uh, these anyway just to chat about the ducks a little bit I did a whole lot of ducks uh, this dragon is probably one of my favorite pieces he was so quick and fresh and spontaneous there was a jugs competition that Esther is so held in Cape Town and uh, he's got a little hinge lid that opens and closes he's a fire water and um, it was just very quick and it is sometimes pieces just give you that joy that you can't describe that it's not as if you made it you were a channel and it came through and you have to keep going back to say did I make it you might not like it but I, I liked it so, <laughs> um it was, needless to say I didn't win the competition some guy made uh, won it with a slab built teapot dead as a dodo sorry <laughs> um this was an early coiled um burnished and polished pot um, 
very early fat form. And I realized that these fat forms were what I was after because of this the kind of this, the full swelling. I always wanted to take the clay out as far as I could possibly get it to take to, to its extreme before it fell down so that it would almost defy gravity. Remember its form, it occupies space. So I wanted that to be fruitful and full and um, generous. Um, yeah. This is part of stone where I was doing in the church. Now, I lived in the church, for, we lived in the church for about uh, three, four years. I always wanted to live in a church, so that's why I lived in a church. <laughs> I saw Alice's restaurant when I was young, and I'm so romantic. It's Alice who lived in a restaurant, and it was just marvel. I just wanted to live in a church. Needless to say, I stuck my head down, did everything that I thought that I could, was good at and stuck to my knitting, so to speak, and the church came along. I met some friends through a dance group and they lived in the church. It was too much for them to clean. So they asked if I wanted to rent it. So um, we rented the church out. It was during this time I made this pot. It's got a very severely undercut bottom which you can't see, but this is my semi-lunar moth where it was um, spraying a, a painting on a slip, probably spraying on a glaze and scratching through the glaze and um, defining lines like that. I really enjoyed scratching through glaze and um, filling in the spaces with, with colors. This is a bit later. This is um, a very big pot. You can't really see the size of it, but this was a pot that I had made for the um, Potchefstroom, Professor in Potchefstroom. They bought this pot. It was very burnished all over. Um, now, one thing I want to say about burnishing all over and then uh, uh, burnishing a pot with oil, you can get it to really, really shine. But if you touch it after, uh, after you've burnished it, um, you won't notice it until the, the um, firing and then all your finger marks will come out. So this pot had been standing burnished nicely and I had some visitors one day. I was having a sleep and the visitors came in and had a look at the place and they all stroked the pot with their fingers, not realizing. So when I, after I fired it, the pot came out with everybody's finger marks stroking down the bloody pot, <laughs> damn. <laughs> anyway, that sure. was, um, yeah. And then 850 Rand was really quite a lot then. This is where I made that pot. This is our house in Hart Bay. Built in 1910 for Senator Lata, somebody in the South Africa, Senator Lata Khan's holiday house. You know, they used to go six months on the other side of the mountain then bring their, their little wagons over for six months in the summertime. So this is near the harbour in Hart Bay. My studio was on the left. Our bedroom was up top there and we were on the natural green belt and the sea just behind us. So um, that's where I did, I converted more to the Raku there. I was doing stoneware with my students and I was doing these little uh, burnished bottles and things this was a combination of pit firing and polishing. Um, you just polish with cobra clear wax and it stays in your texture. Uh, so I had the pit fire pots and the stoneware pots, but then as I say, gradually the Raku came in and satisfied both urges, although I do still pit fire pots. I don't stoneware anymore. Um, it's, uh, it's too high temperature and it's not as alive as I like the Raku. You get the instant change and you get the unexpected unexpected uh, results. Um, at this point, I also like to say that I used to do a lot of drawings and I used to fill a whole page with, with drawings of pots. This is that, sorry, that pot, just one picture back, um, that tall gray looking thing. That was, this was ordering, I was using a mixture of stoneware clay and earthenware actually, but I painted a copper slip on it. It all went black except for a few yellow sort of patches around it. Um, but I was very much into the burnishing and the fire magic of the pit firing. Um, so talking about planning, I used to do a lot of drawings, but nothing ever came out exactly as I drew it. I would, the pot that I would make as a result of drawings would be a kind of a combination of everything put together. Because once you start, it starts assuming a life almost of its own. If I try and control it to a drawing, I find it far too cerebral, controlled, and spontaneous, and not fun, actually. Uh, too much of hard work. I think it must be clay. Can you go forward one? Rika? Pictures of me. 
that, okay, I was into the little burnish bottles, painted a red slip, texture into it. Sorry, it's an out of focus picture, but it was really quite a sweet little bottle. This is about 1982. <laughs> um, and we're moving from, from the church in which we lived to Hart Bay because an offer came up that we couldn't refuse. Um, very lucky to live in this beautiful church, but you know, they to pull down the trees all around it. And the petrol station next door, main road, and a pub opposite. So the dream could continue to be a little bit better. So the next dream was I always wanted to live in a cul-de-sac, and that house that you saw was a cul-de-sac. <laughs> so we lived there too. Um, talking about the dreams, um, when I was a young, I can't remember, young teenager, a friend of mine said to me, flee, that's what some of them called me. <laughs> what do you really want? So I thought and I thought and I thought, you know, I'd love a house in the country where I could feed chickens on the lawn. One day here I was feeding chickens on the lawn and I realized that this dream had become true. So it was stick to what you do best, keep your dreams going, but plans always change. So I'd really veer away from plans altogether. Uh, you miss out the magic that way. This was a little bottle that I had Raku fired, burnished, and then just polished to embellish the holes. I went through quite a scarab phase. They seemed to suit the, the look of it. Um, little pilgrim flasks, they were very appealing, very nice to make. This part, I won an award with it, but it wasn't my best one. I don't know why they chose this one above other ones. However, um, it's burnished, painted with a red slip, burnished some more, and, um, that is, I think, in the Peter Maritzburg Art Gallery at the moment. That was in 1982. Again, quite a lot happened in 82. Um, starting a family, also, I had a two year old son by that stage. And um, my daughter arrived four years after that, and another daughter 19, uh, 14 months after that. So my children were literally brought up on the pottery floor. <laughs> and uh, it's happening to the grandchildren too. <laughs> This is a stoneware bowl actually made also in Hart Bay during that time. Um, it's quite big. In fact, I had a picture somewhere of my one-year-old son sitting inside of it, so it was quite big. Um, it's about 55 centimeters across. I think you can tell from the straw mat. Um, sure. Sprayed, a glaze, sprayed with a glaze, sprayed with a mixture of oxides, scratch the entire background where you see the white away to expose the oxide areas and then sprayed with a stoneware um, uh, opaque glaze on top of that to get the details so I did a lot of scratching I wore out quite a few paint brushes brushing away all the backgrounds anyway it was just one of my glazing techniques there were so many different glazing techniques to play with um, so that was one the pattern slightly repeated outside here are some little stoneware jars. I did quite a lot of these hinges. <laughs> hinges was a kind of silly idea, you know, it's kind of quite weak. If people don't treat the pot kindly, it can snap off easily. But anyway, I was kind of fascinated by the ball and socket joint originally. I like the idea of something fitting in, turning, and then not being able to come out. So locking in like a sort of a key. Um, and um, started with tiny little closed forms it was always closed forms that actually um helped me build i'd build a pot up close it completely smooth it over and then cut the lid all in one um so these little hinges um, went on for quite a long time when i started doing rock was definitely not strong enough for hinge lids actually so um it was more the, um, the rock who led me more to the lips and the openings of pots most of my other pots were lidded like this one too, this one went to France and came back again. Um, um, yeah, you'll find this in Laurette Espy's um, book. Um, she describes how I glazed it completely differently from how I glazed it. But this is a technique I use and it's, it's really quite fun. You spray on your, your opaque glaze, then you scratch your pattern throughout the whole thing. Then you latex anywhere where you wanted white or a light brown. Then you spray the whole thing with very thin cobalt oxide. Then you take off a layer of latex and you throw it with, spray a little bit of iron oxide. And then you take some more latex off and you spray a little bit of 
little bit of um, clear matte glaze where you get the, um, yeah, so that was good fun. Lots of scratching away, lots of detail. And of course, you know, coming from an Egyptian thing. Here we go, still with the Egyptians and the scarabs and, and, the, and the papyrus and my daughter, Emma. So my first big raku pot that I made when I started doing decorations. I've got a lot of decorations going um, because it was, I couldn't resist it. I loved doing the dotted backgrounds to expose the foreground. And um, I tended to divide things up into three. It made it very easy to create pattern. And um, so the color is not too easy here. It is kind of blue and red, but it's a little faded out. However, that was the, yeah, one of the first Raku pots that I had made. Oh, just some doodles about how I go around working out a pattern on paper first so that I can freshly scratch into the clay, when, uh, into the glaze. It's very satisfying scratching into the glaze and then We like to keep glazes very, very, very simple. My mother was a pharmacist and chemist. She had glazes, complicated glaze recipes that would belong as your arm. And I couldn't go there. <laughs> Far too right brain. She was very left brain, plus being left handed. However, um, I fancied the idea of a glaze with a minimum number of ingredients. So I use a clear glaze and then I add oxides and, and other things to maybe opacify or um, well, choose your colors so that it never stays the same. Um, these are little sketches that I did using a little bit of wax on paper and then washing with water. They come up quite nicely, give quite a nice feel if you want to do some sketches. Just ideas for some throneware that I was doing when we moved to the farm. Um, I, my friends Steve Shapiro, Craig Irving and Yogi De Beer wanted to come and build a wood fired kiln for me. And they should, thought I ought to be wood firing, and I absolutely adore wood firing. But I know it's really just for functional domestic wear. That's that's the real thing. So um, I did a little bit of throwing, and I did a bit of wood firing. Uh, sold a little at Gramstown Festival. Half of my stock was then stolen, along with our car. It was stolen. So a bit of bad luck along the way. <laughs> um, this is my veranda. My view out there in the white is ever extending forests and there's a, a, a river valley there, the Karata River. So this is my, my personal paradise, my studio straight through there, through that red arch inside there and the office on the left. This is just a nice picture one of my dear friends took of my tool board. Knives in the right, turn on the right, please. <laughs> I've been teaching ever since that before, before. I gave up for a few years when I got ill. No, I didn't. I carried on teaching all that time, actually. I, I didn't make as many pots when I got ill. But um, I, my students use all my tools that I use, and they respect them that way. This is some more of my beautiful, wonderful view. Looking over towards Neisner will be over that hill over there. Um, so these are two quite large pots. The one is called, the bottom one's called It's a Beautiful Day. Top one, what do we call? Oh, that one. <laughs> um, Henry Caper is the owner of these pots. He's a man, he's passed now. Um, luckily for me, this wonderful man, Henry Caper, was a fan and he used to buy some of my pots. Otherwise, I haven't really sold all that many. Um, they're quite large, they're about so big. Um, okay, how big? Well, they're probably 45 high, by 40 or 50 wide. That's when I got involved in um, painting slips on my, uh, on, my, um, on my clay body and uh, coloring them and then using a clear glaze. When there's no glaze, you get the blackening from the raku. So that shiny black rim will come from the reduction in the raku, the carbonization, the fire magic that happens in the raku firing. So um, this is, um, yeah, Joan, what is this one? 
this armor on it, it must be another Joan of Arc. Again, glazing, scratching, spraying, masking. Um, luckily for me, the rain fell on this pot and created this nice unevenness on the right hand side before I put it in the kiln to glaze. So we I mean, look for some magic rather than planning. Um, oh, it's quite old. This is just getting involved in textures. Um, I found that when I was scraping a pot, the scraping, the little scrapings were always so attractive and they always had a rhythm to them and they had a special quality that you couldn't get if you tried. So I would scrape around the bottom of the pot and stick on the pot. So all that inside rim is kind of like scraping from the bottom of the pot stuck into the middle and then controlled a little bit by the, by the ge geometry just to have the balance between the organic and the geometry. So all about the, the girl and the boy, the masculine and the feminine principle, the inside and the outside, um, the balance between the yin and the yang. And so in the words of Michael Cardew, the hand of the heart is on the inside, the hand of the head is on the outside. By no means can either be omitted. If you've got too much hand of the head, the pot becomes too stiff and rigid and controlled too much heart and becomes floppy and wobbly. So you need both, you need the fullness of the feminine and the control of the masculine to create a well-balanced child. I think I have referred to my pots as children. If you approach them like that, it's much easier to know what to do when you get to the top because you don't have to worry. People's biggest problem is, what am I gonna do when I get to the top? I say, well, you're not there yet. <laughs> um, so if you spend a lot of time getting that, the bottom, working it to your best ability, making a really good start, making a lovely angle, making as much symmetry as you need as in, as in what nature does. There's always a little asymmetry, even in a seashell, a succulent. Um, that's the childhood of the pot. It has a little bit of parental support in the, in the form of a, of a foot that you're going to cut away when it becomes a bit older and can stand on its own two feet properly. And you add a coil and it's, it starts becoming a teenager, a truculent teenager, not quite knowing what it wants to wear, um, changing its mind every five minutes. The only way to find what it wants to wear is just to love it, be with it, and wait for an image to flash across the screen or just something will happen and you'll get an idea. But to plan it ahead means your head's in the future and it's not busy doing what you should be doing properly at the time. So advice for life and advice for pots. <laughs> Spend time, good time with your children when they're young and you don't have to worry what they're going to do when they're grown up. It'll all work out fine. These were pots I had at the Su Susan Elias Gallery in uh, Parkdown North in Johannesburg quite a few years ago. Um, just various techniques of um, rolling. So it's difficult to get close, but all those little, um, there's a whole lot of kind of beadwork. I make a butter pet and make little strings of beads that I string around and put on and I try to still keep a bit of the softness of the clay. So I like to press it down when it's still soft so that it can firm up and feel like it's soft, but it's fired. Um, yeah, and do the top left pot, waterweed. I've always had waterweed themes. You know, you have your little themes that you develop and they come out in different ways on different pots at different times and you never quite know when they're going to do that. But you can see also top left, I'm starting to give a bit more attention to um, playing around with the rim and making that more organic and feminine, you might say. Um, these are all the locally dug red, red clay that I get from dams in the area. We clean it in our machines. We sieve it and we clean it and dry it. And it's the most beautifully plastic clay on earth. It'll take enormous amount of forming and stand where you want it to stand. Um, so it's, and they all Raku fired black bits. I went to quite a dark phase, but the black is quite, is quite um, alluring. This, oh, my color looks a little bit faded. It's really quite a bright turquoise blue. Um, oh, just challenging myself to create effects of, um, you know, how, do, how does the weaving work? <laughs> Once you've got it, and then you can't stop. So I love to try and create a pattern. 
And I like my quite to be looked at from above um, so that you do get the portal, the pattern about being connected to the pattern. That's little Alice <laughs> being brought up on the pottery floor, my granddaughter, my youngest, and that's a geometric portal just come out of the Raku finally. She's helping to wash it down. So um, this is my view from my from my Raku pit, my Raku kiln over across the valley to the other side of the valley. You can see the poplars down in the bottom. There we go, that's the same pot standing up, rather defying gravity. I think the foot's a little bit too small, but the picture is a slightly deceptive. And this is some of my latest work. Um, and it still harps back to some of the work from before. Again, another uh, translation of the geometric portal. Um, trying to think of what, um, where we should be going now. Ah, yes, of course, for 27 years of my life, I have been <laughs> the owner of a business called Hot Art, which is the ceramic fireplaces. Here I am cleaning off some soot after the rock and firing of this gorgeous big turquoise. We love the variation in the crackle. So um, that's me busy, still busy on it. Uh, 25 years ago when a lady and we moved to Neisner, uh, 20, 30 years ago now actually, um, lady in Neisner had a chimney from Mexico which her son had bought her. He installed it in her house and because he put a chimney on the chimney, it drew so well, it got too hot, it cracked. So she asked if I could make her another. Of course, I obliged. I said, thought I'd make myself one too. Um, not realizing that it would turn into the most wonderful business you could actually imagine. When you're packing a kiln, it's one pot in, one pot out. Um, Raku firing, one pot at a time. Um, over the years, it's been had its ups and its downs, but mostly it's been really good. Downs only in that I've had people who have kind of taken advantage. I've got badly, um, um, what's it, frauded, defrauded at one stage. Um, but um, we started we started doing a sort of earthenware fireplace. As soon as we sold it to a man and he installed it, it cracked. So we went to Prof. Olaf Heckert, Cape Town University, and he helped us devise the body that would be fireproof. Needless to say, it's porcelainous so it was white and I kind of thought oh no no I want an African theme I want an ethnic authentic thingy but not realizing it opened an enormous room in my mansion um, in terms of slip trailing which I was always attracted to in one way or another I even did a little bit of thrown away with slip trailing and these fireplaces were totally conducive to slip trailing in any color you can dream up and Iraq who fired them and lo and behold we got this incredible copper that would come through the crackle and um, it just became um, another extension and uh, here's a lovely dragon who reduced beautifully <laughs> that's my typical dragon I would kind of repeat him changes slightly with every dragon but you know how you get your dragon and you get your fish and you get your seaweed and you get the, the different um, motifs that will repeat. This one, sure, this was a custom designed protea. The leaves came out blue instead of green and it would seem to be such a happy accident. Everybody wants these dull pink proteas with blue leaves now. <laughs> so, um, I'll do just about anything. Uh, this is us taking my son in Eric and I taking the fireplace out of the, uh, out of the sawdust, spraying it down immediately, clean it up and get our steam bath for the morning. Um, so this is active Raku firing of the fireplaces. That's a small one. This is a large one, the Nautilus theme. They wanted a Nautilus. They sent me a picture of the Nautilus. This is for a lady who used to work for me and she just was in love with her fish pond and she just wanted the frogs and a dragonfly and butterflies and water lilies and copper please. And so I just, uh, a lovely challenge just playing around my slip trailer is my pen i draw with it uh, this is a view from the inside of the the workshop where we build the fireplaces throughout again my gorgeous view little hibachis on the right there and this is uh, you know grandchildren on the pottery floor 
learning how to print. This is my studio where I've been teaching. And this is my Raku kiln. Uh, it's just checking to see if there's any copper before we wind up or down. Um, best to wear bare feet because then you can jump away quickly. If your shoe starts burning, it takes a while for you to get the shoe off and then you've got to replace the shoe. So your foot will get better in six weeks if you burn. <laughs> this is us reducing. When we reach temperature in this drum outside, okay, once the pots are fireproof and they've been in their specific program, a specific temperature, if I go up five degrees hotter, your pot will crack when you make a fire and it is that, that fine. Um, so it has to be uh, really, really accurate. But um, as I say, oxidized firing is a little bit boring and they look a bit dead. So we like to rock you fire them to make them look like that. It's such a gorgeous crackle. Each crackle will tell a different story, very many different qualities. So, um, oh, there's that portal again. <laughs> that's some reduced copper. So when, that, when the pot's at temperature, I throw sawdust into the kiln and that's why you see all the flames coming out looking for oxygen and pulling it out of the copper oxide. So um, this is how we doing time ice, by the way. Yeah, a few, a few little old, uh, icing, icing things coming very useful for the little stars to make a nice texture there. Um, have we done 40? No, oh, gee whiz. This is an enormous pot actually. And uh, again, some water weed, variation on water weed. Um, it stood around for years, almost waiting for, to, to decide what it wanted to, to happen to it. I was trying to get that brilliant um, reduced copper that went all flashy. And if I put a blowtorch to this part, it would kind of do that. And then it would oxidize over time. So I just said, no, fine. Let's just leave a gray and black contrast. Very subtle. Anyway, so uh, that was a biggie. This is called the belly dancer. Here, you know, like I say, I like to challenge myself a little every time. All those lines are drawn with a knife tip. Every single line is drawn into the white slip with a knife tip so that you can kind of try and create a rhythm. So for me, the more work there is to do on the pot, the happier I am because I know I can sit there in my happy place for, for that long. When it's over, then not something else. <laughs> I do kind of repeat themes a little bit. Uh, this is the one the Nationals didn't accept for the exhibition. Sorry, just a wee jab there. <laughs> uh, I think it's so cheeky. Uh, are we done? Then she's got the catalog. Are we done now with this? I just want to share with you the lovely catalog. So just bear with me. I will share with you the catalog. Thank you, Rika. Where is it? This is your latest. Uh, yeah, this is. There you are, Leslie. I don't know if you want to talk okay. through it. Um, yes, my pots are like un unplanned children. Um, I think I have said that. And the trial by fire, unexpected adult. We all want that, don't we? If we knew it was going to happen, it would be boring. Um, so this was the first time I did that little bit of weaving on the top. And it's. Um, it's a tiny little tea caddy that <laughs> it will fit in both hands, but um, it was a little gem. Um, um, I say, yeah, cutting lids and little hinges are this, and that's a big, the big version of that one. These were exhibited at Trent Reed's Fine Art Gallery in Meisner, um, 2019. 2019. Um, a lot of batch of big pots I've made. Um, here where you've got a, a, a plain, very simple rim that can take a, a big pattern. Not always easy to balance two features on a pot. They need to be complementary. Um, so um, this is just a, a kind of a shape that I get drawn to sometimes. So it looks a little bit unsafe, but I quite like the weightlessness of it. And the rim, um, it has a little, kiss curl around the lip. It's not that easy to see from the photograph, but I do quite enjoy making the rims a little bit sensuous. And there's a bit of slip trailing there as well. This is uh, actually a slip tail gray. This is my, um, uh, I shouldn't have said the China. It should be, it should be called Chinese garb. <laughs> Somebody said I mustn't say the Chinese are here. Um, 
So um, again, challenging myself with the intricacy of those little ties, wanting to, to make it look other than clay, to add value to the clay, trans transform it into something else. Here, the glaze actually was trailed on, I think, in the glaze, and I trailed that uh, a copper additive glaze onto a white burnished slip. So um, you have to be, you can't make a mistake. You've got to just go with it. Bling, bling, blah. <laughs> so, so that was um, Chinese garbers. You know, the Chinese are old heritage. Uh, faithful old seashells and spirals. You can't go wrong. Um, tea caddies. Just playing around, scratching through the glaze to the clay. It's a little hinge tied with a little bit of leather. This uh, is a slightly unfortunate angle, but um, this is the, there's going to be a picture of the detail on top just now. It's called the uh, Biote Sky Dream. <laughs> um, just again, playing around with some, some textures, pattern. Uh, and then, of course, the, the, the crackle always comes out. And you don't know. This is called wire work. And all that work around the rim there is what I was trying to describe before, the, um, the butter pat. And you make little strings and beads, and then you've got to get them to stick on. It's tricky. But <laughs> once you get it, it's, uh, it's quite uh, addictive. So the thing is, that the clay I'm using, the clay I'm using is incredibly heavy in iron. It's a very iron-bearing clay. And as such, in a way, I like to honor that when I fire it and make it look like metal because it is metal and it's been reduced. And these parts, I bisque fire this clay to 700 degrees. It's very low for a bisque, but I can pick this uh, big pot up, single finger by the rim, and I can ring it. So um, that's why I like this very, very old earthenware, red, red earthenware clay. So I can get that lovely iron feel. Um, oh, checkerboards, I did quite a lot of that at some stage. This is called checkers. The mustardy contrast is actually copper. Uh, it's a copper fuming mix that could have gone yellow, red, green, blue, purple, anything, but it did that. So again, just try and keep in the pattern. This. Uh, those are tassels, it's not the greatest view of that pot because it's got a, there must be another picture here. Yeah. This is a very large pot. It's got China Sea and China Sea and slightly subtly around the rim and those little tassels on the, on the edge. A oh, little tea caddy, Tipicina mood. Um, that's the inside of the lid. When I close it up, I sometimes leave the closure and I turn it into a flower or a kiss. Um, so, um, and again, it's a white slip painted on the red clay, so I can get a bright color. Then I spray the pot, uh, the, then I scratch through the, through the glaze to the slip, and then spray on with oxides to get the color at the background, keep the background dark. This one slip trailed with a, just a bit of cobalt and copper added to the glaze. Modest bars, not properly cleaned, I see. <laughs> Another this one, I broke. It's not a very large pot, but it's quite subtle. Is this one there in their way as well? No, it's all oh, Okay. Um, a little Harlequin jar, playing around with some wax resist and then spraying the oxide so you get that stippled, spottled effect and hopefully a bit of copper that comes through in the firing. Um, some water weed in a completely different color com combo. It's the color of the clay in that terracotta. That's just clear glaze on the clay. In the background again has got fuming mixture with a little bit of unexpected stuff. Oh, that's the top of the little bottle. Very odd view. <laughs> okay, you see that just playing with the lip like that. There's a little dragon scales. Just the edge of a knife pressed round, 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 and then make the scales. There's a little kiss there on the right. You can see inside the lid. Um, these are called. Now my friend Kim Sachs told me there's Anatoly bottles. Where's Anatolia? 
Um, I have seen in books and oh, encyclopedias and things before this little pointed bottom, and it really appealed to me quite a lot because it means a pot can't fall over. It just rolls around and around. And um, so I made a, a, a set of these. I was going to experiment trying to get a wonderful effect that, that Duncan Ross gets with those marvelous um, terracottas and black speckles and things. And I thought it's easy, you're just going to put a white slip on it, pit fire it, and then it'll reduce. It, it won't, won't uh, reduce under the slip. Well, I scratched the white slip off and it reduced all the way through. So I spent three days decorating the bottles and sc scrubbed them all off, but they turned out quite nicely. The little rims I pinched out of a little bowl and then I make a hole in the bowl and I stick it to the, onto the neck, join it to the neck to get a nice even neck. There might be another Anatoly in there. Oh, this is a little dandelion, a tiny little tea caddy. This is, yeah, it's a little tea caddy. This is uh, porcelain, porcelain beads printed into quilt, a quilted effect. Very dark, but um, yeah, knife, knife lines for all those um, edges. Some more wire work. This is quite a large pot. Um, enjoying the, the pure greens and things. Oh, that little one's actually back to front, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> a modest little kiss girls. There's kiss girl on the front of it. This is a Celtic portal. These lines are achieved pressing a sharp kidney all the way around on its edge. And um, I sat back one day and I realized, oh my word, I know where that pattern comes from. My mother had a little silver biscuit barrel. I think it was Welsh. And down this, all the way around it had this pattern on it. And I, after I'd done it, I realized that I was sourcing my mother's old biscuit barrel. Um, so inspiration is everywhere. You must just let it come. I think uh, it's the ever, ever fronding organic life, you know, who can resist a frond? Um, you know, I must add quite a lot of drawings to try and get the the idea right was such a big pot and it's quite a lot going on there. Um, not the best angle for a photograph of it there, that's better. <laughs> I think from the top, so I've slip trailed the pattern on the outside where the black is and I've scratched through the pattern where the, where the pale, pale, pale green is and then it's got a couple of sort of belly buttons, the porcelain dots just to add because it's got a very plain rim. Um, yeah, earth clouds, just some pit firing, burnished, quite a large part of that. Uh, just some cloud magic, there's a bit of spiral on the top of the room. The cat knocked uh, The other one, the cat knocked the other one over. <laughs> uh, yeah, what can you do? The cat knocked it over. Um, ah, yeah, don't worry, you can go to the next one, Rika. This one again, a lot of texture, just just getting carried away with pattern. Pattern can radiate and can go everywhere. Um, fruity portal, that is. They're a little bit dull. They need their places. That's it from above. So um, a little bit of geometric combined with organic, I find. Um, provides the contrast. This is some, again, a fuming mixture that went greeny, yellowy. It's a bit of a funny angle, but uh, yeah, that's the Piote portal, another angle. Um, just spontaneous as I can. This is slip trailed um, and then pit fired with no glaze at all, just on the porcelain beads. They still got that part. Hmm. Yeah, this is um, again impressions with knives. A little bit of a flaw there, but you know, flaws the wabi sabi. <laughs> wabi sabi means a perfect imperfection. So there's some more water weed. Um, well, there's that's Trent. Very kind. Uh -huh. Yes, we've come now to the end of your um, presentation. 
Leslie, I just want to stop the recording for a moment. Ah, Rika, thank you, my darling. Uh,